populated and we're starting the recording. And Dan, I will let you know. And we'll start we'll start taking questions at about 645 ish. That sounds yeah. great. If that okay. works for you, yeah. And yep. just so it's over around seven. Okay. All righty, Dan, why don't you go ahead and get started? All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan, and I'm part of the events team at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington, and I'd like to welcome you to our event tonight. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. In fact, we are celebrating our 121st anniversary this year. Uh, we are currently open to the public 12 to 4 every day and also offer curbside pickup. So please check our website, ubookstore.com. That's the letter U bookstore.com for the latest information about our hours. Tonight's uh, University Bookstore is proud to present Clover Hope in conversation with Dowdy Abbe. Clover Hope is here to discuss her new book, The Mother Load, which highlights more than 100 women who have shaped the power, scope, and reach of rap music, including pioneers like Roxanne Shante, game changers like Lauren Hill and Missy Elliott, and current reigning queens like Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, and Lizzo as well as everyone who came before, after, and in between. Uh, Clover is a writer and editor based in Brooklyn. Her work has appeared in the pages of Vogue, Vibe, Billboard, The New York Times, Wired, ESPN the Magazine, Essence, and The Village Voice, among other publications. And she is currently the culture editor of Jezebel. Tonight, she is in conversation with Dowdy Abe, a professor of humanities at Seattle Center College and author of six and Six in the Morning, West Coast Hip Hop Music 1987 to 1992, The Transformation of Mainstream Culture, and uh, as you can see over his shoulder, Emerald Street, A History of Hip Hop in Seattle, in which he chronicles the development of Seattle hip hop from its earliest days, drawing on interviews with artists and journalists to trace how the elements of hip hop flourished in the Seattle scene. Just a few more things before we get started. We will post the link to the book through the, uh, to purchase the book throughout the chat periodically. So keep that up as well as um, Dowdy's book. And the event is being recorded and will be on the University Bookstore's YouTube channel in two to three days. If you have any questions for the speakers, put, please put them in the Q&A field and then they will, be and they will be answered as the event progresses. And right now, let's just turn this on over to uh, Dowdy and Clover. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be amongst you all and uh, an honor to be speaking with Clover this evening. Clover, sis, how are you? Mute, 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 mute. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, it's good to be here. One small thing is that I was a culture editor at Jezebel, now I'm at uh, a contributing editor at Pitchfork, so. Okay. Yeah. Got it, thank you. And how are you? How, how I just want to check in, you know what I'm saying, on my people, just, you know what I'm saying, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, it's like a rough couple of weeks, you know, mm -hmm. with like uh, a lot happening news-wise with, yeah. um, you know, in hip-hop, you know, especially with, you know, DMX's passing and um, Black Rob and, uh, you know, so I'm kind of, you know, com coming out of that cycle or, you know, I like just kind of like we're still in that cycle mm -hmm. of, um, morning, you know, so yeah. Doing the best you can, like like a lot yeah. of us. Right, right, right. All right. Well, it's good to be with you here uh, this evening. Um, you know, I, I first, I guess I want to just start with just, I was saying earlier when, when we came on, just how much I love just the feel of this book and the smoothness of the cover and the, the thickness of the pages, you know, it, 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 it feels it feels good in my hands to read, and uh, and the topic is something that 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 is uh, of interest and exciting to me. So I just feel like the whole package, not only the content, but also also what it comes wrapped in, is just it's outstanding. So I, I, I readers have a lot to look forward to if they really enjoy the entire experience of the read, not just the okay. words on the page, but the construction of the of the material. So I, so I appreciate that. Um, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, I suppose the natural first question is just kind of, if you could tell us a little bit about 
where the inspiration came for this particular book, The Mother Love, 100 mm -hmm. Plus Women Who Made Hip Hop? Well, um, yeah, it's so the inspiration, I guess, in short, just comes from my life, like growing up in hip hop. Um, you know, I like to reference uh, Brown Sugar, <laughs> like that movie, um, movie you know, yeah. it's uh, with Snow Lathan and, um, and Tay Diggs, just about like, you know, how hip hop like kind of like formulates uh, your, some like, you know, your, how it kind of like forms a bedrock of um, your upbringing or like yeah. your formative years. And so yeah. for me, I was a teenager when I was like discovering uh, hip hop in the nineties. And um, that was also a time when it was, uh, when it started flourishing like commercially. And a lot of the artists that I just like connected with naturally were the women artists, you know, um, mm -hmm. from Lil Kim, Salon Peppa, Missy, Eve, um, Trina, later on. Um, I just kind of like left eye and TLC. Like I kind of uh, naturally, like I loved hip hop, you know, um, in general, like rap artists, uh, like rap artists who were kind of um, on the radio all the time. And obviously like it was easy to kind of um, absorb that. Um, but then it was just a different special connection with like, the women who were doing it. And so I just kind of grew up always um, having that kind of appreciation um, for what one, like kind of what they have to go through uh, separately as women in this business um, and in this industry and culture that's very, um, you know, the word we hear a lot of just like, you know, uh, predominantly male, uh, you know, male dominant. Um, and, you know, I kind of just connected with it also just as a girl growing up in the world and as a you know, young woman growing up in the world. And so once I kind of um, got the opportunity to kind of to write up or, you know, I kind of was like, what type of book would I write um, as like my first book? <laughs> and it's, you know, something in hip hop, something, you know, about women um, and something about like this uh, culture that I love, um, like how women contributed to it. And so it just kind of like naturally formed um, into an idea. Um, and like my editor had already been thinking about like wanting to do a, a book on women in hip hop. And um, so, you know, it kind of came about that way. Like it was just very like kind of natural. Okay, like this is the story that I want to tell. Um, the story I want to tell is like a different version of hip hop um, history, like from like the perspective of this girl growing up in it. like again, Brown Sugar, like Sanaa Lathan's character is, you know, right. like it's about her love of hip hop and how that it shaped her. her and, entire life. Yeah, and her, that becoming a love story. So mm -hmm. in a way the book is a love story, um, yeah. you know, about like my love of hip hop and how, um, like a great, uh, one of the great blurbs from Aaliyah um, King Neal is just about, um, and I want to read it because it, it's just kind of like sums it up well. And she's Me like, too. Um, you know, uh, hip hop, which we love and hold dear, does not always love us back with the mother load Clover Hope uh, loves on us. And so that's kind of, that's the story. <laughs> like sometimes hip hop doesn't love women. And it's like, what is the story behind all of that? That's what the book tells. Right, right. Yeah. You're absolutely right about that. One of the things that, that that's, you start very off, start off early, start off mm -hmm. early on in the book, addressing is is the the the, the title in itself the, the female right. rapper uh and and you know that reference and and you, you have a, a quote here that says female rapper never quote quote female rapper unquote never sat well with women who thought of themselves as simply rappers who identified as women and there's a story uh at the beginning about uh Roxanne Shante mm -hmm. and her entry into a rap contest. And the fact that on it, on her merits, she won the rap contest. Right. But the fact that someone, and the fact that someone like Curtis Blow, who was a judge in that contest, you know what I'm saying, basically docked her points because she was yeah. a woman. It just seems like, that seemed like a very unhip hop move right there. That seemed like, you know, if hip hop is supposed to be about your ideology and your skill and your authenticity, going against, voting against somebody because they were a woman, 
seems very anti hip hop. And I remember thinking that when I when I was reading through that part. Um, and so I'm just I'm just wondering, like, from the beginning, from its early points, how were you kind of able to best describe or outline these additional, it's hard enough to make it in the music business as it is. Mm -hmm. But if you add this intersectionality of black women, predominantly trying to get up in there, how are you able to best kind of identify the prevailing themes of, of some of the obstacles that they were, they were running up against? Right, right. Yeah, like it's, it's really, um, I think it's because, uh, I mean, obviously like I am a black woman in America, like in the world. And so um, I can like identify with uh, these women who were growing up in this culture. And then I was also like in hip, you know, I'm in hip hop, I'm a, uh, journal, a hip hop journalist and music journalist writing about it in the space where I'm mostly surrounded by men um, mm -hmm. writing about hip hop. Um, so there's that sort of kinship um, already. And then um, in terms of like how I kind of tried to lay it out, it was basically, you know, what is the larger story of hip hop that I'm telling through this person? Um, and so that made it a little bit easier to pick out like how, like what angle each entry would take um, because the way the book is laid out, it's different entries on uh, different prominent women. So you have an entry on like Song Peppa um, for a few pages and then Queen Latifah. Um, and the it's not just like a biography of them. It's sort of like, what is a story of hip hop that we can um, like glean through this person's career? Like what did they do for the culture? And like, what does their story tell us about like about hip hop? And so that's kind of like how I wanted to approach it versus like, here are some things that this person did that was like successful. <laughs> you know, like I wanted to kind of be able to tell this larger um, narrative about the themes of, you know, sexuality within hip hop and like um, feminism through people like Swan Peppa and, uh, you know, MC Light and uh, Yo-Yo um, and, you know, gangster rap, like there were women doing gang gangster rap, you know, and uh, doing conscious rap and, you, all the kind of like uh, spaces that hip hop took up, like there were women also taking up that space. And so I wanted to, you know, just kind of like fill in that blank. And once I thought about it as, um, you know, the story of hip hop through women, like it, you know, it was, uh, you know, um, that, that helped me kind of like formulate, you know, um, the, um, to come up with the format basically. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of uh, a couple of artists there. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like Conscious Daughters. You're talking about like Conscious yes. Hip Hop. And I think of a group like Conscious Daughters. Um, is there... So, oh, I know what I wanted to ask here. It was about mm -hmm. Shantae. I'm glad I <laughs> reminded myself yeah, yeah. because it was Shantae. So I noticed that there was some... And, Forgive me if I missed it, but there was some reference between, you know, the issue of Shantae and the real Roxanne as it related mm -hmm. to the kind of back and forth between UTFO. Um, and, and the real Roxanne, I don't think she has a, a, a section here in the book. And I'm curious about how you, you know what I mean, how you finesse that situation mm -hmm. of, of the popularity of Roxanne Shantae, who in the aftermath of that definitely has sustain much more of a career than the real Roxanne. Um, but where, where does, where does, I'm just curious about where, where you feel like the real Roxanne kind of fits in that, in that, in that narrative of, of, of what was mm -hmm. going on with UTFO in the mid eighties. Yeah. I actually tried to reach out to, to her. Um, really? and there were like, there were artists that, you know, I wanted to be able to like tell their stories, um, you know, like incorporate it in a bigger way or kind of like get more information. But um, that was one where I wasn't able to kind of like reach her um, I th or I think like like there was some um, uh, back and forth, but then we never like locked in. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I just kind of lost touch. She like I couldn't like um, get her back. So um, I'm glad you asked that because, yeah, no one has like uh, brought that up. But like there are people who I did try to kind of like get that like their kind of side of the story or their, um, you know, uh, contribution to hip hop. Um, and part of it is that, you know, a lot of this information isn't readily available unless you speak with the artists. And so that mm -hmm. was part of the project was like, I'm going to have to speak to these women um, because their stories aren't like, I can't Google it or like, it's not something that's like kind of um, 
you know, just kind of accessible in this way. And so, um, uh, you know, the book was attempting to kind of like fill in that, uh, fill that gap. And uh, unfortunately there were some women who, you know, either I reached out to and I like, we just couldn't, like, I just didn't hear back from them or um, like, didn't like, they kind of like stopped responding or something. So uh, like that, uh, that does affect then. It's funny cause that does then affect the outcome <laughs> and like, you know, then it's like not, it's like they're in the book, but not like, it, you know, like they're kind of like, it, it's like left out in a way, <laughs> you know? And that's interesting cause it kind of mimics how the, story of hip hop happens like just they just end up being left out um because men kind of um you know for the most part it's like either they're not considering the women who were uh part of the story and so they end up kind of just telling their version of of hip hop uh that's like very predominant like just male like men doing things successful things um and they leave out like the women um uh and so anyway like yeah it's interesting um that uh that it happened that way but yeah I did try to kind of like get that part of the story and I wish it could have uh happened but I do yeah I mentioned kind of her as part of the mm -hmm. you know like that battle um mm -hmm. uh legend that Roxanne created or like that you know that that um uh initial hype that Roxanne like all the Roxannes like <laughs> created um like through those records that they made. Um, and just for some background, so Roxanne Shante made, uh, responded to UTFO's like um, record uh, uh, with her own song where she um, basically took on the persona of Roxanne. Like her real name is like, um, like Lolita, like the, Roxanne was not her name. And so she basically brought that record alive by like, um, like uh, becoming Roxanne Shante. Mm -hmm. And so um, amazing feet in itself um and then after that like utfo kind of responded and tried to kind of um like i guess reclaim roxanne like the name roxanne by putting out like the real roxanne mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so just for some like context that's what we're talking about you know um shy rock <laughs> shy rock who you kind of identify it you know she went she went way out of her way to make sure that everybody knew <laughs> You know what I'm saying is she was the one who set it off. Um, she was very definitive um, about that. Um, and so as we go up, we we, we talked about um, Roxanne Shante and her kind of response to UTFO's Roxanne. But I, I, I'm I'm there was a I'm I'm seeing and I'm reading kind of a uh, a familiar theme just in terms of how rappers during that time would often get started is they would take you know what I'm saying they would have disc records you know, or response records. So Roxanne Chante was one who became, uh, who got her name out there like that, but also Salt and Pepper did that with yeah. their song, uh, Showstopper, which was in response to Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh's Crew song, The Show. Um, so mm -hmm. in that way, they were kind of similar. These, at least these couple of women artists uh, were similar to, uh, relative to the dynamic about how they got their career started and how they, how they how they got got noticed um, for the first time. Um, so, Salt and Pepper, you know, they are the first women to to go platinum. Uh, they're the first to win the rap Grammy. First women uh, to win the rap Grammy. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of help uh, situate uh, for us where Salt and Pepper stand in this kind of historic canon of women in mm. hip hop. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess first going back to the response records, like that is such an interesting phenomenon because it was a way for women to kind of like get noticed um, by playing off like a popular record. And that was something that I kind of like, uh, I guess like latched on to. Ice Cream Tea. More... Ice Cream Tea was on <laughs> Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince's first album. Right, yeah. In a Roxanne like, type situation. Mm hmm. Like the more the girls record, ain't like nothing they, but trouble. I think it was boys ain't nothing but trouble, or something like that. Exactly. They would yeah. just do like a gender flip, and that happened with a lot of these records. Like, uh, like a lot of like Miami like bass artists were just like, um, it was like, boom, I got your girlfriend. Boom, I got your girlfriend. It's like, boom, I got your boyfriend. And so you know, it was just way to kind of like, um, basically like you know, subvert, um, you know, what was happening. And so in that same way, like, Salt and Pepper was all about um, subverting subversion. 
and um, kind of like taking expectations of what, how uh, people maybe um, viewed women in hip hop or like viewed just women in the world. And they took those expectations and flipped it in their own way. Um, and so the entry about them is on that, how they kind of like many of their records and many of their, like throughout their career, they took on this kind of task of um, one, just kind of, um, you know, sh showing the, uh, kind of like showing like the position of women in hip hop, like, um, you know, like th there's the general, the kind of like primary narrative is like, okay, men run this or whatever, like, you know, you got, you know, like the men are kind of like running, telling the story and their idea was like, we have our own story. And it's like, this is like on the flip side, uh, you know, a, a song like Tramp, you know, they're basically like all men are tramps. They're like call, calling men promiscuous or Shoop, you know, where they're basically like cat calling guys and being like, oh, like, look at that too. <laughs> you know, like they're taking on this, like, um, the you know, like they're this persona that um, quote unquote, they're not like, supposed to um and so they for me like their role in hip-hop is like um just creating an uh an anti-narrative or like creating like this um alternate uh version of the story like you have like the maybe the main story is like this guy walking down the street like trying to you know holler at some like um some young woman and their version is like well, like I'm reclaiming that and being like, okay, like I see a hot guy and like, I'm gonna, you know, like I, like, you know, he's the eye candy or whatever. And so it's just this really cool, like, it's just such a, when you think about it at that time, like eight, late eighties, nineties, you know, that was um, just so provoc provocative or like, so kind of like game changing um, what they were doing and they were making it pop like they were making you know push it and shoop or like these are rap songs that were like pop um the and shoop both, video like, they're like on the beach with men running <laughs> around in bathing suits you know what i'm saying yeah. they turn the whole video mm -hmm. formula on his head yeah like the men become like the objects of um you know like the the video models yes. you know and so that's like um you know just a way to kind of like turn the lens a bit and make sure that it's not just um you know just like it's this isn't like the story of hip hop or hip hop doesn't just belong to men mm -hmm. and so i think that was their role um just kind of showing that like reclaiming and claiming like territory and within that obviously the i guess the um, flip side was that they did have a male producer like herbie azor mm -hmm. like writing um a good amount of their lyrics <laughs> and you know kind of like spearheading some of this so it was kind of this it was actually this um very uh, convenient, like it's really kind of like the story of hip hop. Um, like these women who are like, like you know, um, uh, sh demonstrating power or kind of like um, showing this sort of empowerment, uh, but behind the scenes, like this guy is kind of like, um, is the one with the influence and power and money to kind of like steer them in that direction. So, you know, on the surface, it's like, oh yes, like, you know, women power. And then really they're disempowered like behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of like just a classic story of um, like women's like position in hip hop, I think, like coming through, through art, like, you know, song Papa. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work my way somewhat mm -hmm. chronologically as, as we yeah. go ahead. And so I'm, I'm <clears throat> just, just wondering about how you view, so salt and pepper certainly were, um, in touch and embracing their womanhood just in terms of like we said the shoot video and songs like push it and you know not running from sexuality i guess is, is, mm -hmm. let's talk about sex you know what i'm saying songs like that right but then you also have people emerging at that time like mc light and latifah who i don't want to say i don't think it's necessarily to correct to say that their style at least initially was asexual but it wasn't mm -hmm. it was not it was not it wasn't like salt and pepper was doing it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. MC Not Light was talking face. about, was talking about men. And she was even being, you know what I'm saying? In command with her sexuality and paper thin when she talks about 
you can suck the big toe and play with the middle. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was not, but it was, but she was wearing turtlenecks at the same time and, and kind of baggy jeans. Um, and so I'm just, I'm wondering about your, your, your view on those transitional figures who start to bring along with salt and pepper hip hop and women in hip hop more to the mainstream, but are not doing it in a way that today we are accustomed to women, predominantly women do. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess in a way like there was still some kind of conforming happening, um, you know, even as they were, um, you know, uh, telling this, uh, this story of um, basically as they were kind of like um, rapping basically about feminism, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like being like feminists and rap, there was still some sort of com conforming like of like in terms of visually like they like an MC light is um obviously like you know people just have their natural style like she liked to dress like that um and part of it may also be trying to you know like wanting to like fit in with the guys and not um seem like you're like separate and like oh that's the girl rapping you know um and it's like all right I'm just gonna like wear a clothes and like I'm this is me and I'm like just I'm just another rapper like I'm not just like it's like a sort of a way to not call too much attention to you being like to them being women in hip-hop you know it's like um like I'm just one of the guys so like I'm just kind of like like don't kind of like separate me or whatever and so I kind of see it a bit like that where it's you know part of that was just uh survival kind of um like needing to kind of, um, you know, maybe it was like subconscious. It's not like, you know, t you know, saying every day, I'm gonna wear this so that, you know, like I don't c come across this way. But um, I think, you know, some of that is maybe like subconsciously like a survival thing of, um, you know, I need to like uh, fit in and not like rock the boat and, you know, put on like some, like, I don't know, <laughs> like sexy dress that's gonna call attention to me being a girl rapping basically. So, um, you know, like that's how I kind of look at it. And then once, you know, Kim and like that era of female MC came, female MC came along, it's kind of like they were, you know, Kim and Foxy and, um, you know, to a certain extent Eve and like the Trinas, they wanted to kind of push back against that and be like, all right, we're, you know, to show the feminine side of like, um, like the female MC um, and show that, you know, we can wear, we can dress sexy and still, and be like skilled MCs, you know? Um, so I kind of like see it, see it as that, you know, like it's like the MC lights, you know, that era was kind of, of about like survival. <laughs> you know? mm, right, right. That's, that's a great point. You know, I, you talk about in the book about how uh, speaking specifically to Latifa, who's more or less made the jump to movies now. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I suppose she still does music occasionally, but her main thing is acting and about how her role in Set It Off was so controversial. Um, right. For it, at least people thought at the time that it, so I mean, apparently people, according to the book, some people thought it might be a career killer for her. Yeah. She was going to yeah. play this kind of butch lesbian character, Cleo, uh, in, uh, in Set It Off. Yeah. Yeah, like it was, uh, there's a um, quote I used from this interview she did um, where the interviewer was just kind of like, um, are you sure? <laughs> just kind of like, are you sure about this? Like it's, you know, you're, you don't worry about like, you know, ruining your career, like playing a lesbian. And, um, you know, it's interesting to kind of like look at where, um, you know, that decision that she decided, that decision that she made, uh, what was that, 90, mid 90s, Mm -hmm. um to kind of steer her career in a different direction a bit um partly because um you know in terms of longevity like a career you know in hip-hop is not exactly at that time it wasn't like you could see it lasting you know for a long time it's like all right I have to do something you know like I have to kind of like supplement or um you know like this is not going to last um you know so what else can i do and you know the artists like her and will smith and you know 
Ice Cube and like, you know, all of the rappers that kind of got into uh, um, acting, um, you know, you can see, you can kind of like see how that decision making happened basically. Um, so I don't know if I'm getting away from the question, but like it's, you know, like that in terms of like the role itself, I think it was basically like the risk is worth it or whatever, or like whatever risk that, you know, other people felt she was taking, I think she was kind of like, well, this is worth it. Like this is um, a career making role. And it's, you know, like, I don't, you know, I think she just kind of like was thinking long-term basically. I, I wonder if Will Smith was 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 challenged similarly when he did. I believe he did the film Six Degrees of Separation, oh, where yeah, he played yeah, a yeah. Gar- gay character, maybe yeah. around that same time ish. So I, I yeah. just I don't know, but I wonder if he was challenged in that same way about taking that role. Mm, yeah, yeah, probably not. That, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, it's a different time, so right. um, uh, I imagine there was like skepticism, or you know, the actors actors then had to kind of, um, I guess, like, just kind of weigh the risk a little bit more than maybe now where it's like, like, it's fine, <laughs> you know, but yeah, so her, like, that role ended up being for Queen Latifah and set it off being like a great move. I mean, that's like a classic character in, right. in, uh, definitely in hip hop cinema, but I mean, for me in like cinema overall, but, right. um, you know, like she, she really like, you know, killed it and that you know was a launch pad for like where she is today which is you know she's back on, on top of the game you know, like yeah yeah and on really? a hit show you know right. so right yeah. okay well it worked out <laughs> trying to be mindful of time here because i know i'm yeah. not going to get to all these points that i want to talk it's a lot about. so yeah <laughs> so, so uh so okay one of the drawing points immediately for this book was your girl l boogie I have her. Mm-hmm. I have her as one of my top five all-time favorite MCs. Uh, Lauren mm-hmm. Hill, we're talking about, and her career. I was reminded of some of the twists and turns of her career. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm having a difficult time really coming up with somebody who released a such a singularly. I don't even know what to call it. Such a singularly monumental piece of work in an album and then that was as a solo artist and then that was almost it mm-hmm. um and 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 you, you the the section in there is reminding me about the questions that came up around producers who weren't getting credit uh that she settled with and then all of a sudden there became questions about how much did she really creatively did she right. have to do with the with the project like that and i'm and i just uh, there was <laughs> You know, I mean, she's talking about Ali appears in Zaire to reconnect 400 years. I mean, you know what I'm saying? On the Mm -hmm. When We Were King soundtrack. I mean, there was nothing about her that I did not absolutely love. In my opinion, the greatest singing, rapping talent combination of all time. Yes. yes, I'm just, I just, I'm just, I read what you had to say in the book, but I'm wondering if for the audience, you could just kind of reflect on there's so much to reflect on, but just Lauren, uh, kind of briefly yeah. on 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 our girl Lauren Hill. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's Woman, I should such, say. Yeah, like it's such a like you said, like one album, and then like I mean, she did uh, um, like the unplugged album after that, but right. like in terms of a studio album. Um, and not just be, an album, but an instant classic. A classic, yeah. Like you'd be hard pressed to kind of find a similar example in music in general. Um, and to then not kind of like follow it up, you know, because so many people like, you know, there are people who've made like, um, you know, had a classic debut, but then they have like a, you know, second, third, fourth album. Soft, and, sophomore jinx, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And this was just like one and done. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, it's just such an interesting case study, I guess, of like what um, a woman in that position has to kind of go through. Like she was just instantly kind of, um, you know, catapulted to this, um, not just like hip hop success, but like commercial and like she's winning Grammys and she was kind of um, just like in this really in like, uh, like weird critical space of, um, being a darling in like um, both mainstream and like rap circles. And so 
she was like in her early what early mid 20s at that time and so that's a lot to deal with and um you know it's also she then had a child and like people were telling her to like her career was over and mm -hmm. you know she put that in the song and so when you think about just like the emotions of like her being this young woman in the music business who becomes this huge star and then has this kind of like drama scandal with her band member Wyclef bandmate Wyclef and then like has this child and like she's kind of like you know trying to figure out her career what to do next it's, you know like it when you see it as a just a story of um um just like a story of a young kind of um prodigy having to kind of really don't. have that pressure put on them um like it makes sense that she would just have like one album <laughs> and sort of disappear and say, I don't want to deal with this industry anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and then the, yeah, the kind of like uh, the producer uh, um, the lawsuits that were uh, leveled against her in terms of like creative input on the album, you know, like it's just kind of, all these things were coming at her. And I don't think we have an example of many musicians who've had to kind of like deal with that um, at such a young age and ex the expectation that was kind of like on her also to then follow up this, you know, classic with this, this very quickly, it's like, oh, what are you gonna do next? And, um, you know, it's on top of that, you're the, like save you're like the woman savior like oh she's like the hottest woman MC and like you know this is what all women should like you know model themselves after Lauren because like she is like you know doesn't have to like sell sex and you know it's like all that was like on her and um you know it's just a difficult position to be in and so for me like she kind of represents that um that difficulty of like having to kind of um be uh, you know, exist as a woman in this space where it's just so, you just think about it all, all the time. Like the fact that you are a woman doing uh, like this thing that you love, like you, she can't like not think about it basically. Uh, like people keep telling her <laughs> that like, you're a woman doing this, like you're separate or like you're kind of like different or, you know, like it's, she can't just kind of like uh, rap. Like it's, that's something that's always, being thrown at her so that makes me think of you know i don't know if you're familiar with the concept of stereotype threat but you know it makes mm -hmm. that makes me think of like you know in the, the idea around it was where you know for instance if 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 like a woman was going to take like a math test they would give like a a, a, a reminder that she was a woman before she took it like do you live in a single mm -hmm. sex dorm or something like that and what they found in the research was that those types of reminders, you know, would have a depressing score on people's performance. And so I'm, 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 I don't necessarily think there's a direct correlation, but there could be kind of some indirect effects as you're speaking to that mm -hmm. weigh on the shoulders of female artists in the ways that they do not for men. Um, I don't know if there's a question yeah, here. It's just yeah. kind of what, what, what you made me think of right there. Yeah, that's really interesting though. Yeah, because it's it's just this hyper awareness, like, you know, being black in America, like you're right. always thinking exactly. about being black and someone's always telling you you're black or like making you aware that you are black and different. And yeah. so for these, um, you know, like primarily, you know, black women, you know, black and brown women doing hip hop, like they're getting that. And they also get like, oh, you're a woman also, like, mm -hmm. don't forget, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. it's, um. You know, it, yeah, it's 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 uh, something they have to kind of like walk around with, basically. So, sort of, kind of dovetailing. I don't know if dovetail is the right word, but around the same time, we start to see more female artists who are more to have a more raw approach uh, and are uh, interested in taking control in a very aggressive manner of their sexuality. I think that. And you did you did include them in here, and I think one one group that's kind of overlooked when it comes to that early on was BWV, who yeah. were doing that, taking that approach like in the early '90s. Um, you can look up what the name stands for, but it's somewhat along the lines of what NWA was talking about. So it's you know, with is the is the common is the common word in that in those in those two group titles. 
to the W. Um, but then you get more into the mid 90s and we start to see that transition. Um, we start to see it with people like Foxy Brown. We start to see it with people like Lil' Kim. There's a portion in the part about Lil' Kim that talks about the, I don't know if you, if it's if inf, if famous or infamous is the right word, picture of her in the spotted bikini in the squatting position. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a, a little more historic context now uh, as this transition starts to happen within female MCs, female rappers who traditionally, like we just said, like MC Light wearing turtlenecks and baggy jeans and Queen Latifah wearing kind of more Afrocentric garb uh, to now women who are, as I said, being much more aggressive and in your face uh, in taking control of their sexuality. Right, like the mid nineties, you know, Kim comes out with hardcore, Foxy Brown comes out with Il Nana. And those are really two genre shifting, like uh, culture shifting albums, um, not just musically, but uh, like visually, because they aren't, um, they're kind of like, you know, putting their sexuality like on full display, um, both in their lyrics, they're, you know, super raw, they're rapping about sex, wanting sex, having it and um, desiring it. You know, and they're, you know, wearing bikinis and kind of like just kind of fur coats and like, you know, it's luxury and it's all about like femininity and um, claiming this kind of like womanly uh, power that they have. And so, you know, obviously that ends up being like a huge shift in the culture in terms of, you know, it's one of these catch 22s that like, you know, it helps, um, it's this kind of liberating um, force that they kind of like created, um, you know, showing that, you know, women, you know, so, you know, like black girls, like, you know, have like urges and like their sex, you know, like they're sexual beings, like women are sexual beings as much as men are. So like there's this, uh, you know, service that they were providing in that way. On the other hand, you know, it also creates this expectation that, you know, women MCs have to then uh, sell sex and like be mm -hmm. um, sexy in order to like be get noticed and so then that becomes like the template for women in hip-hop it's like well now like that was successful so now all of you guys have to like wear like you know you know uh bikinis and like you know tight clothing and you know this is just the way it is um yeah go ahead well i was just gonna say i, I I'm, I'm interested in so you know i was telling you how i teach this hip-hop class and mm -hmm. in the when we talk about gender, I show the the Lil Kim video, how many licks, and there's a there's a scene yeah. in there where she's driving around town in like a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something, and she pulls over and there's a dude on the sidewalk and she kind of pulls him into the car and there's a, a message that side says on the screen, what does it say? It says, uh, "She doesn't satisfy you, you satisfy her," and so mm -hmm. there was a level of there's a level of control uh, right. that exists. Uh, in this presentation of sexuality uh, that it's not just here for you to take. It's not just, you know, it's not just whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. There are levels to this game. Um, and so th it did strike me that there was a level, there was, there, were there, was, there was control that they were maintaining as they were presenting themselves in this way. Right, yeah. It's about like, you know, they have the agency and kind of like, um, you know, like wherewithal and like desire to kind of like, you know, state what they want and, you know, kind of uh, claim that space um, in terms of sexuality. And then uh, somewhere in there, there's still like men kind of directing the mm. visual, like being, you know, Biggie kind of being the person who picked out that Kim photo where right. she's squatting uh, right. to use as, you know, like marketing. Right. Um, you know, like it's those two things going hand in hand where like they're being able to kind of like the women are expressing themselves um, in the way that they want and kind of um, being able to kind of, you know, really just kind of um, liberate their sexuality. Um, and then it's kind of like the, there's still like men in the industry alongside them being like, yeah, <laughs> yes, do that. Uh, like, you know, in, in a different, like it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's pushing them in a different way. Um, 
like for the on the business end of it versus like the creative end you know mm -hmm. um they're they're wanting to sell sex and the women are kind of like wanting to um you know selling sex yeah but then also wanting to show like um that you know women can be sexy that um women can kind of like do it without like having all these expectations or kind of um stereotypes around it so um yeah it's kind of all these things happening at once you know i think that's what made that era so interesting it's just you know and like uh obviously like change the game so um yeah it's like all these questions that it created um for women and one of those questions is, is, is so it's, it reminds me of the gangster rap era in the late 80s and yeah. early 90s where 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 a question started to emerge around where is the line between you know what i mean giving realistic portrayals about what's happening on the streets versus glorifying what's happening on the streets yeah. and, and it seemed like there was somewhat of a parallel question that started to come up for female MCs and as the 90s got later on somewhat similar about where in 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 the ways that Foxy Brown and that Lil Kim are presenting themselves, where is the line between exploitation and empowerment? Um, mm -hmm. what, what what are your thoughts on 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 if if you have thoughts on what that line is and and how these artists once the '90s get going further closer to to, to the 2000s have negotiated that line? Yeah, I mean it's a hard kind of. Um uh answer because they're operating within a business and so it's not like they can just kind of be creative on their own like uh, it's not like they can kind of like neglect that there is a business happening and mm -hmm. you know they have to like sell records um i guess what i'm trying to say is like um like the i feel like pop in general is like exploitative like pop music and because hip-hop at that point was becoming pop basically in the 90s um they were making popular commercial like rap and within that like there's a certain amount of like selling and like exploiting and like um putting something on display in like this excessive way because you know it's like you guys we got to go all out um and so there's that, uh, you know, I think, um, I do think that like, you know, we, as the music evolved, um, there's a way in which uh, like female rappers have had a little bit more say or like more say in how they're presenting their image. Um, you know, when you think about maybe like a Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, um now versus maybe kim and foxy um it's a similar kind of like aesthetic and kind of um you know they are rapping about like sex and money and uh power and you know being women trying to claim these things and um but like the women now kind of have more like they can kind of just put out their image like on their own terms like there's you know, not necessarily with a man being like, oh, don't do that. Or like, <laughs> or a man kind of like a male executive being like, you know, well, let's choose this image or let's do this. Um, not to say they don't have that, but I do think that because of social media, like a lot of these women now can kind of like have a more of that control and like have more of that, um, you know, um, have, you know, claim a space where it's kind of, you know, challenges that idea of whether it's like exploitative if that makes sense um mm -hmm. you know I just also just think it's it's just hard to kind of I guess that word like it's hard to kind of not be exploitative in the music business because like you're just always selling something I guess so um yeah it's it's a hard position to be in especially for women like they just are everything is visual for like you know for them um so I try to give a lot of them a benefit of the doubt, kind of, you know, like it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes, I don't know if that is. No, that's good. That's good. And yeah. it kind of leads me up to kind of the the, the last point I just like to make mm -hmm. here with you is the, we are now in the era of, well, I guess Nicki Minaj is not that she's washed, but she's been around for a while <laughs> and, 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 and Cardi B 
uh, and Megan Thee Stallion. In the case of Cardi B, we literally have a woman who was a stripper who made the transition to, you know what I'm saying, record-breaking status yeah. for female artists in terms of like uh, being number one yeah. on the chart, right? So I'm just I'm just wondering where where do you think it's headed? I mean, is it are we are we going to always be stuck now that we are here in I don't and I don't even want to call it a rut, but kind of with the formulaic approach of how female rappers present themselves, or will we have? And I cannot go through this hour without mentioning Missy Elliott, who has you know who was kind of the master of being able to mix the two together, just the straight hip hop with also feminine wiles and 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 that side of her. I'm, I'm wondering where you think it it goes from here after a song like WAP. I mean, where 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 do we really go from here? I think it just opens the world up to like the world of like possibilities. Um, you have this this success model and like this story, and it's like okay, like let's see, you know, what else is out there. Like what you know, I guess if people are thinking about who's the next Missy, or um, you know, I don't think she's kind of like. Uh, I mean, she's kind of like irreplaceable, but um, I do think there will be like along those lines, uh, women who will kind of like present different images or like um, we have it already right now, just like in terms of on a charting scale, like that's not um, happening, um, you know, like uh, on a large mainstream level, but we do have, you know, a lot of women who are kind of like creating their own space, like on, you know, they have their own followings and like they, you know, are not, you know, they don't have the image that like uh, Cardi B has or something. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of space to see um, for that to kind of like grow and where we will have like someone, I'm not gonna say like Missy, but like in the Missy arena, <laughs> kind of like becoming big. I, I think that's gonna happen, like a woman, yeah. Well, as the, as the father, of a daughter and the soon to be grandfather of a granddaughter I, I, I'm I, I would be I would be happy with the the return of diverse images for women in hip-hop uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't be mad at people you know at, at the hustle that, that people have now but you know it's it's for me it's kind of like kind of like asking you know will we ever have like a public enemy equivalent where it's a very kind of politically minded group that is a mainstream kind of mainstay. Right, right, right. uh, you know, I guess that's an open question for, for the future of hip hop. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we well, uh, we have Dan on screen. So uh, I think here I'm supposed to let me take a look real quick. Yeah, well, it looks like we do have one question in the Q&A. Uh, what other books do you see as being in conversation with yours? Ah, I think they're question. looking for what uh, some uh, more recommendations for great books about um, hip hop artists and or hip hop cult, mm. uh, music culture? Yeah, um, well, there are a couple other, like uh, last year, uh, God Save the Queens was uh, another book on women in hip hop um, that a friend of mine, Kathy, um, uh, published. Um, there's, I mean, there, I think we're kind of, um, you know, seeing more and more like documentation um, uh, documentaries, history, like all of that uh, archiving of hip hop um, because it is still or was still kind of like a young genre. Um, you know, we're seeing like this, the Biggie documentary that was on Netflix and kind of like the Nipsey Hustle book that um, Rob Kenner, who's another colleague of mine, released uh, like this month. And so I think all of that is in conversation with each other and with my book. It's all about kind of archiving hip hop and kind of showing the um, depth of like the story, like in the same way that we have all these different types of like, um, like, like, you know, rock books or like, you know, um, kind of like uh, uh, monuments to rock um, across uh, different like media. Um, we're seeing that with hip hop and like that. Um, so I think like, yeah, all of all of these are, in, I would say like, uh, my book is in conversation with the documentaries as well, <laughs> you know, like that are, that we're seeing, um, you know, Saw and Peppa biopic, the Roxanne Chante, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's just gonna keep happening and it'll kind of just help tell this, uh, just, it, you know, tell a richer story of hip hop. 
I mean, in terms of like the larger world global community, hip hop's only been around 40, 40 years. I mean, so it's yeah. still very, very young. And we're still like people like myself are just kind of getting of an age where the cultural influences of our lives influence the work that we do, you know, hence, mm -hmm. hence the books that we're writing and the classes that mm -hmm. we're teaching. And so I feel like this, this lean into hip hop scholarship, although it's been around for a little while, it's really starting to pick up steam as more and more people get of an age where there's more and more material to write about. So yeah, I exactly, feel like we're just yeah. getting started. Right, and to retell and tell and like uncover, um, you know, it, there's a lot, there's still a lot to uncover. I mean, I watched that Biggie documentary and was like, oh, there's so much of this I didn't know and I have been writing about hip hop for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there's always like a new way to tell the same story. So I think that's what's happening. Okay, well, it looks like uh, that's about it for questions. I have, we're just about up, uh, up against it for time around seven o'clock, but I'm just curious uh, if you, if I were to ask you what you thought, if you had, let's, how should I phrase, phrase it? Um, if you were to, to point out uh, a kind of singular artist or a singular mm -hmm. song, that stands out to you. Maybe it's an artist by, maybe it's a different artist and a different song, or maybe mm -hmm. it's a song by that artist. I'm just wondering your thoughts about, you know, the, the perhaps it's unfair, but in the, in the time of picking, you know I'm saying, picking stuff in this one or that one, and who's the greatest, that kind of thing. If you had thoughts about uh, either the most influential, the most, uh, the most groundbreaking uh, artist uh, and song, uh, mm -hmm. however you want to qualify that. Well, I'll, I'll do artists. I do think that the like pivotal woman in hip hop um, is Lil' Kim. And like, she has the longest entry in my book. And she, I just feel like there's pre Lil' Kim and there's post Lil' Kim. And it's like BC, AC, you know, like it's like, she kind of, there was so, it was just the way hip hop was before her was um, for women was like, so different than it was after that I think that she, her impact was just um, uh, incre incredibly um, great and also sad and that it's still reverberating today because in the, um, you know, visually, uh, like lyrically, um, in terms of like fashion, we're still seeing her influence and like- um, You think she gets her proper credit for that? Um, I think she does in a way, but it definitely, um, I don't think like, oh, like overall, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, you know, people uh, name her as an influence and they're like, you know, like, yes, I've, when I saw Lil' Kim, I wanted to do this or right. um, I do think that happens. But um, I think just the, the way that she kind of like shifted things for women is just like so monumental that um, definitely there could be more. Like, I want to see a Lil' Kim biopic, uh, you yeah. know, like she, definitely deserves Is there a like book a movie. On her? and um I don't know uh, I mean a book also yeah but has <laughs> like, there been has there I'm trying to think not like, not one that I yeah okay. I don't I don't think so um okay. something to think about yeah <laughs> yeah and then uh how about a song you have a particular song that you look um, at as kind of transitional hmm. or kind of I mean I do I always think of like um Queen Latifah, uh, U-N-I-T-Y, yep. <laughs> you know, yep. it's just like that era of like women saying like, I'm not gonna kind of like allow this um, and putting it on a record like that. Uh, Punched him dead in his eye. Yeah, yeah. And it's like answering, it's like a response to, to what is actively happening to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that is like a just, brave and um it was like a huge kind of um it was just such sort like a really huge kind of like way of claiming her space like so I I just look at that song I mean um, and for that song as much as U-N-I-T-Y was the chorus mm -hmm. in, in to my mind who you call in a bitch is as much of a chorus I know, in that right? song yeah. as U-N-I-T-Y that's the part that like I remember <laughs> like that's the title exactly. of the song to me but <laughs> yeah like it's uh that was just kind of like such a yeah, and I remember hearing it also, like, you know, and being like, oh, wow, like, this is powerful, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I have to say, uh, it has been a pleasure uh, speaking with you this evening. Uh, greatest of luck on the book. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. 
100 plus women who made hip hop. Uh, like I said, once you get your hands on it, you'll see what I'm talking about, just in terms of the luscious holding experience it provides for the hands. Um, and uh, I'm, you have any I have any thoughts or ideas what uh, what your next project might be? Um, well, you mentioned Kim, so I'm like, maybe I should work on that. But um, yeah, no, like it's I'm um, gonna let this marinate for a bit. And uh, I really appreciate talking to you guys and like. Um, yeah, like it's great conversation. And I'm glad that people are kind of like talking about women and that we have this kind of surplus of uh, female rappers now. And I kind of just encourage people to, you know, like just do the little homework and kind of see where this, uh, how we got here um, mm -hmm. to this point. Okay, thank you, Clover. Well, thank you, Clover. That was excellent thank you so and much. outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Dowdy, for um, leading the discussion here. Thank you and so a uh, huge thanks to everyone. Yeah, my pleasure. Huge Clover, hey, Clover, hold on. If you do that little Kim mm -hmm. book, we're going to have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, this uh, event will soon be available on U bookstores, University Bookstores YouTube channel. So let your friends know they, they missed a great conversation. And you can also purchase copies of The Mother Load as well as Emerald Street through the University Bookstore website. And as soon as that little Kim book comes out, we'll make sure to have that uh, posted <laughs> up there too for sale. And thank you for joining us. Uh, please check out our website, social media, sign up for our emails, and uh, join us in store this Saturday for Independent Bookstore Day. We'll be open from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.